came to be, to be the living word of our life. He came to die, to die so we be reconciled. He came to rise, to show his power and might. And that's why we praise him, that's why we sing, that's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything Cause he gave his everything He came to live, to live a king in us He came to be, to be our conquering king and friend He came to heal and show the lost ones his love He came to go, to go prepare a place for us That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. Halle, hallelujah. Halle, hallelujah. Cause he gave his everything. He gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Mm. That'll get you on it. Welcome to Twickenham. Glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. If you are a guest, thank you for coming to be with us today. We're really honored by that. And if you are looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members, and we'd love to talk with you about how we receive new members. If you're going through a struggle right now, we'd love to help in any way we can. I can't promise that we can fix everything or even anything, but you won't be in it by yourselves. We're just glad you're here. Thanks for coming. You can put a, uh, there's a card on the seat in front of you. You can write down any prayer requests on that, place that in the collection plate a little bit later on, and then uh, we'll uh, pray over those. If it's private, let us know. We'll keep it just uh, between the elders and staff. If you want everybody to know, we'll make sure the whole church is praying over it. Just really, really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Hey, let's do something. This is an audible. Okay? Yeah, it's an audible. <laughs> let's stand and just give somebody nearby a hug. Somebody's going to need a hug today. Let's do that. Let's stand and give somebody a hug. chapter 5 they sang a new song saying you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain 
and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve God and they will reign on the earth he hasn't just made us to be a kingdom from every race and tribe and nation and people on the planet this is the really weird part we are his temple he is in us this moment not this building us we are that temple let's praise him for that let's welcome jesus into this temple this morning love divine all love excelling joy of heaven to earth come down fix in us thy humble dwelling all thy faithful mercies crown jesus thou art all compassion pure
Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts people from every nation who fear him, and that's what is right. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One spirit, one voice to praise you. We are the body. church in front of which it stood. It was made of railroad steel, and it was very dramatic, and I was moved, and I was impressed as I walked by and away from it. I once saw a cross, so lovely it was a work of art, carved and polished. It was made to look both strong and delicate, and I was moved, and I was impressed as I walked away from it. There was once a cross, not so high. Not so lovely. It was not a work of art. Rough and full of splinters. Uneven. Unsymmetrical. It's simple mystery, unfathomable. And I cannot walk by it. And I cannot walk away from it. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to be together. Uh, Father, most importantly, we're thankful for the reason that we're all together. And Father, it's the cross. Um, Father, we are so thankful that you sent Jesus. And Father, we're thankful that he was willing to come and uh, live a life as a human, something that we can identify with, Father, and to um, to be willing to die on that cross for us, Father, to have his body that was broken there, not because of anything that he had done or anything that he deserved, but because of everything that we do and everything that we deserve. And Father, we are so thankful that he was willing to make that sacrifice. Father, as we partake of this bread this morning, Father, as we remember his body that was broken for us, may we focus on the cross. May we remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. Father, may we remember that um, it is much more than anything that we deserve. But Father, we're so thankful for your grace. Father, we're thankful for your love. 
Help us to focus on that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. change your thank you for your son. We thank you for allowing him to leave the splendor of royalty from heaven and to put on our skin and walk around this earth with us. We thank you for allowing him to wear the thorn of crowns, the, the, the crown of thorns, and for allowing the nails to be piercing, pierce his flesh and for not calling 10,000 angels. We thank you for the blood, Father, and as we drink this cup, I pray that you will help us remember the blood that was shed on that hill for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
As we have worshipped this morning, we have proclaimed you the king. We have asked you to come into our hearts as the dwelling place, as the temple that you now reside. We have called to be one and to be unified. We have shared in the fact that our names have been changed and that it's all because of your cross, a cross that we cannot walk away from. And we pray now that you would build your kingdom here in this time and in this place and in this day. And that as we have shared these things that you would continue to open our hearts to Jody's teaching on a subject that is in the forefront of his mind and in his heart today that he has wrestled with all week. We ask your blessings on him to proclaim your word and to proclaim it boldly, and that we would listen with hearts and ears that are tempered for what your teaching is today. Bless us and thank you for our time of worship. As we stand together and we all say in Jesus' name and all the degrees say, amen. Let's stand. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray, unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church we pray Revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom. Power, reaching the near and far, no force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seen in us, fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church, we are the whole. your kingdom here let the darkness fear 
Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here, let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Be seated, be seated, thank you. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 today, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, it's in the New Testament, uh, first four books are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the Gospels. Acts is the fifth book, and we'll mention that one today. It's kind of in there all by itself. It's a sort of a history book. And then what they call the letters or the epistles begin. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 St. Corinthians, Galatians, and we're just going to get to Ephesians today. Ephesians chapter 2. The text that we're going to read will be on the screen, but it would be really good for you if you've got a Bible, uh, either the old-fashioned kind or on your phone or tablet. Go ahead and look that up so you can come back to it later on. We'll probably raise some questions today that you'll want to go back and revisit. Speaking of which, I need to give you a heads up about where we're headed. We're going to talk about an uncomfortable issue today. Um, this will probably not be a lot of fun. I mean, there may be a fun moment or two, but for the most part, I, I, let's put it this way. I have not had fun working on this all week. So misery loves company, all right? So you're going to have to go with me there. It'll be a little bit, a, a, there are going to be moments, I think, when some of us may feel really challenged, confronted. And others of us may feel really conspicuous. And if you brought a friend with you today, halfway through the sermon, you're going to be trying to figure out how you're going to apologize when it's over, okay? Maybe not. Um, on the other hand, when we're done, you, you may go, I don't know what the fuss was about. What, what were you worried? I'm just, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is I want to be sensitive to the fact that some of us are going to find this a sensitive subject. So if you kind of stay, stay with me all the way through, I think you'll feel good about where we end up, even if there's, it's a little bumpy in the middle. And I want to mention this too, at the, we don't always do this every Sunday, but this morning um, we want to give you an opportunity to respond publicly to whatever God has put on your heart. And it, it's not just to the, there, there may be something in the sermon, but frankly, some of the songs we've sung have already convicted me. I mean, that last song, we lay our lives down for the kingdom, really? Am I doing that? I feel really convicted by that song. So we're going to provide an opportunity for you today if the Holy Spirit has been moving in your heart or if something has been moving and you don't know what it is, my, I would say it's probably the Holy Spirit, but God may be doing something to draw you closer to him. And if you want to respond about that in a public way, at the end of the sermon, we're going to have a song and you can come down front and we'll pray with you. If there's something you're dealing with that you need help with, we'll, we'll pray with you about that and try to help you with it. Maybe there's a change you need to make in your life, and you want to ratify that today by saying, I want to make this change, and I want you to help me. Okay, so that, we'll do that at the end of the, the message this morning. Uh, here's our roadmap. We are going to read this passage from Ephesians chapter 2 in just a second. I just want to get it out there in front of us. And then I'm going to tell you the first part of a story from, from my life, and it's likely a story that's going to make make you uncomfortable at least some of us uncomfortable and so then we're going to talk about why it's uncomfortable to talk about the issue that's raised in that story and frankly in this text and then we're going to walk through the text learn some lessons from it and then finish with what I hope are some actionable responses to the issues raised and then I'm going to tell you the rest of that story okay uh, so we're going to start with a reading now in Ephesians chapter 2 I'm going to begin in verse 11 and we'll read down to verse 22. Ready? Here we go. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised 
by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in, in that one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Powerful text. Great, great passage. So, this story. When I was 11 years old, I took a day off from attending my, uh, my public middle school, Buford Middle School. Um, I was in the sixth grade. I took a day off and, and went to visit the new Christian school they had opened up, Greater Atlanta Christian School. Uh, GACS, a lot like Madison Academy. And uh, the, the view, that they went from 7th to 12th, so the, view, the, the idea of my visit was that I was going to go there the next year. Uh, and so they assigned me a kid to follow around with me, to lead me, kind of lead me around, which was just awful for both of us because I didn't know him and he didn't know me. And it's an awkward situation anyway because you, you go to this place, all the kids are older than you, and you don't know any of them. So it's just weird, and you're, you're an adolescent, and you haven't figured out who you are yet, it was just, and, and they were a startup, so all of their classrooms, you know, now, nowadays we have trailers when we're overcrowded, they didn't do that back then. Back then they, they erected Quonset huts, which is the, a lot of you guys in the military used to stay in those, right? So everything was in a Quonset hut, and they didn't have a lunchroom, so you had to brown bag it. So I brought my lunch. And so me and the other awkward kid are sitting there having lunch, not talking to each other. And all of a sudden, this very gregarious, self-possessed, confident in his own skin kid named Tony comes walking up. And I mean, he is just so confident and full of himself and just everything. And he comes up and he grabs a, one of the metal chairs and he spins it around and sits in it backwards the way confident people do. <laughs> and he patted me on the back and he, he reached his hand into my bag of chips, took one out, popped it into his mouth and said, how you doing, new kid? Mind if I have a chip? And I lied because I minded a lot. <laughs> but I said, no. I don't mind. In fact, you can have the whole bag. I don't like them anyway, which was another lie because <laughs> this was Lay's barbecue potato chips, which was a luxury at my house. So I never got those, and I'd had like one, and he stuck his hand in there. And, and it was just icky. You know how somebody touches your food? Are you this way? It's just icky, right? But that's not really, I'm, I'm not a germaphobe. I mean, ask anybody who's around me 10 minutes or so, I'll chew your gum. I don't care, right? <laughs> but the, the thing that, that made me not want to eat another chip out of that bag is that Tony was black. And I, I could not handle the thought of eating something his black hand had touched. See, that, 
that story's a little, a little hard for me to tell on myself, and it, it's probably not a lot of fun for, for you to hear. The truth is, we don't like talking about these kinds of issues, that stories that, like that raise and, and texts like this raise. That issue makes us uncomfortable. If you're white, especially if you're old enough to remember how things used to be, there's a feeling that so much has changed in terms of the way people think and in terms of the way they behave. The overt and often violent racism that you witnessed when you were growing up, and some of us in this room witnessed it. We saw it. That stuff that we saw and witnessed, or at least knew about, knew that was a, a part of our world, is now a relic of a shameful past. A lot of white people were thrilled that we elected a black president twice. And yet, with all we've seen and with all the changes that, that a lot of white people have seen, there, there's more grievance than ever, it seems, and we're a little baffled by that sometimes. And then there's the uncertainty, if you're, if you're white, about what to and what not to say. And so a lot of white folks just don't say anything. And then somebody says they're so steeped in white privilege, which is a real thing. We'll talk about that one of these days. That you're so steeped in white privilege that you don't even notice race, racism. But then if you do talk about it, they're, they're almost, you're almost certainly going to say something wrong, and then you've committed a microaggression. And so a lot of white folks just don't want to talk about this issue, especially in church. And right now you're wondering, what's in chapter 3? Okay. But i got to tell you, it's, it would be no easier if you're black. See, if I were a black preacher and, and I was doing a series on the book of Ephesians called Identity, who we really are. And I had started in chapter 1, and I did all of chapter 1, and I'd gotten through chapter, the, halfway through chapter 2, and I got to the middle part of chapter 2, which is what's next, which is where we are, and I was supposed to preach a sermon on this text. I would struggle with that if I were a black preacher. Because here's what you have to do when you look at an ancient text like this. You have, to, you have to understand what's going on in the text, figure that out. What did it mean to those people? And then you have to come over here and you have to look at our cultural circumstances, our situation, and figure out in what ways is our situation similar to their situation so that we can find out God's word to them and God's word to us. And the clearest cultural connection between where we are and this text is race relations and racial division and racial reconciliation. That's the most obvious thing. That's what this text wants me to talk about. But if I'm a black preacher and I talk about that, I'm worried that some, some of the white people in my audience are going to say, that's all y'all ever talk about. So it's, it's hard. Either way, doesn't matter whether you're black or whether you're white. And even if it was easy to talk about we got to talk about this because our culture's talking about it. And i got to tell you, the conversation they're having out there right now is not very productive. It's a mess. The church needs to have a seat at that table and be a part of that conversation because we've got something to say. And we don't have something to say because we're smart or right or righteous or good, we got something to say because God has got something to say about it, and that's what's missing in this conversation, in the culture. So this morning, as awkward and as uncomfortable as it is, we want to see what this text has to teach us. Okay, we're going to look at three lessons. We're just going to walk through the text now and see what it wants to say. The first thing that it wants to teach us is that human beings have always been better at division than addition. We've always been better at division than we have at addition. Look at verses 11 and 12. Therefore, remember, that's the first command that's come up in the book of Ephesians, by the way. Remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ 
excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Paul is pointing this audience, his audience, to the past, to the past, and he asks them to remember what it used to be like. Back in those days, he says, they called you uncircumcised. See, it's interesting that we're reading such an old, old document and one of the things that Paul points out is that they had name calling back in the day. They called people names. You know, sometimes when you call somebody a name, that's just your way of saying, I am angry with you. You ever do that? Call somebody a name, and I'm, really all you're saying is, I am angry with you. You're not really attacking them, you're just, just trying to say, I'm mad. It would be a lot healthier if you just say, I'm angry with you, than call a name, okay? That's just kind of an aside. But sometimes that's all it is. Other times, though, when we call people names, we really are attacking their identity. That's what we're attacking. And that's what's going on here. When, when, the, when, the, when the Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcised, in, in their culture, that was the Jews' way of saying to the Gentiles, you don't belong. You don't qualify. You are less than. We've been calling each other names for a long, long, long time. And let me just say, we're not to the practical part yet, but as a very practical matter here, if you're still using racial epithets, stop. Stop. It's not Christian. It's just wrong. Verse 12, he says, this wasn't just a name you were called. This was reality. He uses three very potent words, separate, excluded, and foreigners. The Jews raised segregation to an art form. They washed di dishes Gentiles might have touched. They wiped out seats Gentiles might have sat in because they were afraid they would catch contamination for the Gentiles. If they'd had potato chips back then, they would have given the whole bag if a Gentile had put his hand in it. There was even a wall in the temple with a sign, and this is a, this is a picture of that sign, that uh, a, a, a image of the stone that appeared in the temple wall, and the, and the sign said in Greek, in Greek, so that the Greeks could read it, no man of another race is to enter within the fence around the temple. Whomever is caught will have only himself to thank for the death that follows. It wasn't enough just to say, do not enter. It said, do not enter or you'll be shot. In Acts 21, I mentioned Acts at the beginning here. Did you know that in Acts 21, a race riot broke out in Jerusalem? Because of a rumor that Paul, the apostle, had brought a Gentile into the temple. This is an incredibly ironic story here. Paul goes to Jerusalem. He, he comes to Jerusalem in Acts 21 with a, a, a huge amount of money that he has collected from non-Jewish churches, Gentile churches. He brings that to Jerusalem because the Gentile Christians are donating money to give to the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who are starving because of a, a famine. Okay, so the Gentiles are sending money to the Jews. When, when he comes to Jerusalem, the Jerusalem leaders are all like, oh, Paul, this is awesome. We're glad you're here. This contribution is going to feed a lot of people. That's great. Paul, people are saying that you're out there teaching that Moses doesn't count anymore. So it would really make it easier for people to listen to you and smooth out a lot of the rough water if you would maybe take a vow and go to the temple and do a ceremonial cleansing so that people would know you still value that. And Paul goes, okay, I'll become all things to all people. So he shaves his head, and he goes into the temple. Well, some Jews see him in the temple. And they, earlier that day, they had seen him with Gentiles. And so they think that he's in the temple with Gentiles now. So they spread this rumor, Paul the Christian has brought Gentiles into the temple, past the wall that they're not supposed to go past, and this riot erupts. They're beating Paul to death. They are literally beating him to death, and he's about to die when a squad of Roman soldiers, Gentiles, come in and rescue the Jew from being beaten to death by the Jews. It's a crazy story. But it's another illustration of how we're really good at division, not at addition. The thing I want you to see here is that the penchant to pigeonhole people 
by, by per, pejoratively labeling them, the effort to exalt your group and exclude the other is not uniquely American. It's not even new. It is really old. You guys have been studying Jonah, is that right, in your, at the shack, in the weeknight study? The reason Jonah didn't want to preach the gospel to the Assyrians is because of this. It's why Nathaniel was skeptical about a Messiah from Nazareth. It's why Peter pretended to be a racist when the muckety mucks from Jerusalem showed up in Antioch. Humans have always been better at division than addition. So if that's the way it used to be for these folks, how was it when Paul wrote them? Well, look at verses 19 and 22, the second lesson. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. There are six sermons in those four verses. Let me put it this way. We're better at division than addition. Here's the second thing these verses teach us. These verses teach that God is an adder, not a subtractor. Look at verse 19, how the words Paul uses draw a tighter and tighter connection. He says, you're no longer foreigners, but it gets better. You're not even strangers anymore. You're known. And then he says, you're citizens, but it's even better than that. You're family. You are members in God's household. You went from foreigners to family. He changes the metaphor in verse 20. You, you, you Gentiles... And, and by the way, I'm going to guess that everybody in this room is a Gentile, okay? I have, I'm not sure about that, but I'm almost positive that everybody in here is a Gentile. So this is really important to us. He says that you people who were excluded, you, you couldn't go past that sign in, in the temple, you are now included as building materials in a holy temple God is building through Jesus Christ. You used to be threatened with death if you entered the temple. Now you are the temple. What he's talking about here is the church, not this building. This building is not the temple. This building is not God's house. This building is nothing. It's just where we meet. It's awesome because it's paid for. That's cool. But it is not the temple. The temple is sitting in the building. You and I are the temple. The church is is the temple of God. The church is the holy temple that God is building. So what happened between the first two verses in this section and the last four? What miracle did it take to turn people who were foreigners into family, to tear down a system that threatened people with death if they stepped over the line, and to create a system that elevated people to become the temple of God? Look at verses 13 through 16. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who, made, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Three words in those four verses teach us how God put to death the hostility and division that we're so good at. The three words are blood, flesh, and cross. You ever wonder why we have the Lord's Supper every Sunday? Right there it is. Blood, flesh, and cross. Jesus isn't the only one who died on Calvary. Everything that divides us was nailed to the cross and died with him. 
And Jesus isn't the only one who rose from the dead on Easter. A new humanity came with him. No longer Jew or Gentile, no longer black or white, no longer Asian or Hispanic. Now we all have access to God through Jesus Christ. It is no longer about race. It's about grace. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to give you some actionable responses to this teaching because we need to do more than just walk away thinking about it. What I'd like for you to do is certainly to walk away and think about it, pray about it, and if you come up with some ways that we can put this into practice Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday, why don't you shoot me an email, Jody, J-O-D-Y, at twickenham.org, okay, Jody at twickenham.org. If you have a complaint or a criticism, send it to steve at twickenham.org, okay? If you get an idea, shoot, shoot me an idea. Let me give you something to consider, okay? I've got four of these. First, if you are a Christian, this teaching challenges you not to settle for an identity defined by the sins of the past. If you're a Christian, this teaching challenges you not to settle for an identity defined by the sins of the past, either yours or anybody else's. We are not defined by the sins of the past, whether they were sins that were committed yesterday or sins that were committed four, five, six hundred years ago. I am not suggesting that we pretend there is not a history of oppression and victimization in our country. There is a shameful history. In many ways, to borrow the old biblical phrase from Jeremiah, our teeth are set on edge because our, our forefathers and mothers tasted sour grapes. We are reaping the consequences of sins committed centuries ago. But Paul himself even begins this section with the word remember. So I'm not saying that we need to forget about that, but remembering the past does not mean that we live there. Here's what I think. I could be wrong about this, but I think a lot of people are trapped in the identities of either victims or oppressors. This teaching calls us to embrace the new reality of verse 13, a reality that begins with some very liberating words. You can hear the chains fall off with these words, but now. Here's how it used to be, but now. This teaching calls all of us to trust the power of the blood, the flesh, and the cross to set us free from the shame or the guilt of the past and to accept one another in love and forgiveness. Maybe you need to be the forgiver. Maybe you need to be the repenter. But all of us need to be who this passage says we are. Fellow citizens, members of God's household, a building joined together, a holy temple in the Lord. That's what we are. I don't care what anybody else says you are. That's what God says you are. Second, This teaching challenges all of us, whether we are members at Twickenham or not, to be a part of the kaleidoscopic, variegated, multicolored kingdom of God. Twickenham is not the whole church, but Twickenham is the church, and we simply need to be more diverse. We just do. We need people who are not like us. We need to be actively and humbly and lovingly seeking to welcome, uh, uh, lovingly seeking and welcoming people who are not like us. I mean, Paul said once, I became all things to all people so that I might win some. Doesn't it sound like that if a church is representative of all people, we'd have a better chance of reaching more people? And isn't that why we're here to expand the kingdom borders of God? If you're visiting today, and you look around and you think, man, there are not many people like me here. We need you, okay? It, we, we just need you. If you're not an engineer, if you don't put your pens and pencils in a pocket protector Monday to Friday, we need you, <laughs> okay? If you're more familiar with a Zamboni than a tractor, we need you. If you're black or Asian or Hispanic, we need you. We we need all different kinds of people, colors, ages, 
Because that's how the kingdom of God works. Third, if, number one is don't, don't let anybody define your identity by sins of the past. Number two is we've got to be a part of a diverse church, diverse kingdom of God. And third, I want to invite you to keep your eyes open for evidence of the kingdom of God in the world around you. And when I say kingdom of God, what I mean is places, instances, moments where God's will is being done on earth as it is being done in heaven. Instances, moments where it looks like something special is happening and could really only come from one place, from God himself. You know how you don't really see something until you're looking for it? A couple of years ago, I, I, I had to get a new car. My car was dying. I had an ultimate. It served me many, many years. It was a great car. But I did, I did some research, and I had certain um, uh, technical and aesthetic limitations that I, I wanted to hit. I mean, those were, I, I wanted certain things in a car. And I finally decided that the, my, my budget, my technical and aesthetic pre- uh, preferences could all be met with a Hyundai Sonata. And I began, you wouldn't believe this, I began seeing Hyundai Sonatas everywhere. They were everywhere. I still see Hyundai Sonatas everywhere. If you see a gray Hyundai Sonata, it's probably not me, because there are a thousand of them just on Whitesburg. They're everywhere. I, I began looking for them, and I saw them. They were there all along. I just didn't see it until I started looking. So I want you to start looking for evidence of the kingdom of God in terms of race relations. Turn off your cussed TV news. Turn off your talk radio shows. And I don't care if you listen to Audie Cornish on on NPR or Rush Limbaugh. Doesn't matter. And while you're at it, go ahead and, and take a fast from your favorite news websites because all you are going to see and hear is violence because that's what sells. And if all you see is what the media brings you, you'll think we're about to have a race war. But like there's some kind of code of racial animus that must be obeyed. The code dictates that you must at least be suspicious of people not like you, and it's better if you're actually angry at them. That's what you'll see on the news. So just turn it off. Do this instead. Just watch people while you're out. Just look at people while you're out, at the grocery, in the restaurant, on the ball field, in the school hallways. Lisa and I have a little saying that we, you know how you've been married to somebody a long time, you just have, you have these little things that you say to each other, and we, it's a little meme that we have. Whenever we're out, we'll, when we see people violating the code, we'll say, they didn't get the memo. They didn't get the memo. At Blue Plate last week, we took our younger son and his wife to Blue Plate because we wanted them to have some local flavor, and so we're sitting there in blue plate, and we've placed our order, and near us is a, is a couple in their 70s, and they're dressed like folks from the greatest generation dress when they go downtown on Saturday. They dress like it's Sunday. And so she's wearing a dress, and he's wearing a dress shirt buttoned to the top, and his slacks are creased, and she, they just look perfect, and they've got gold wedding bands on, and they're being so tender and solicitous with each other, so tender, so sweet. He's black, and she's white. They didn't get the memo. Last weekend in Atlanta, we stopped by our favorite Mexican restaurant in, in Atlanta. And uh, we're on our way to see our, our grandbaby on Friday and Saturday. We were over there for Easter, then back over here for Sunday service. And we stopped off at, at, at uh, uh, Taqueria Los Hermanos. You need to, if you're in Atlanta, go to Taqueria Los Hermanos. Okay? And then compare it to Rosie's and let me know what you think. All right? So we're, we're, we walk in, and there's about eight people sitting at a table, and they are being... You ever been in a restaurant where people are being way too loud? I just, I, they're just being way too loud. And I would have said something, but Lisa was with me. So um, we're, we're, they're just being loud. But, but they're all from the same company because they all wear the logoed shirts. They all got the logos on. And it's somebody's birthday because there's a big birthday cake. And they've sung happy birthday in English and Spanish. And they've had a lot of margaritas, okay? I'm pretty certain they were not planning on a productive afternoon, all right? They were having a ball. They were having a ball. Half of them were black, half of them were white. Didn't get the memo. Didn't get the memo. A month or so ago, we were at Bridge Street. You know, there were five or six teenage girls walking down Bridge Street, laughing, talking, texting, 
and doing something else on their phones, not, not looking at each other, not looking at where they were going, looking at their phones, but they were somehow communicating all with each other while all talking at the same time, walking down Bridge Street. Three of them were black, two of them were white, didn't get the memo. We're at five guys. These high school boys come walking in. They order enough to feed an army. They sit down, and they, they already know how men communicate, which is not at all. They sit there. They grunt at each other, one-syllable grunts. One of them nods, and they're all okay with it. Two are black, two are white. They didn't get the memo. Keep your eyes open for evidence of the kingdom of God, the rule of God breaking into the kingdom of this world. God has already broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He is bringing people together if we have eyes to see it. He will build us into a multi colored, multicultured, multi-personality temple if we will have the faith to follow. Okay, last one. This will be the hardest one, I think. Surrender your prejudices. Surrender your judgments. Surrender your anger. Surrender your superiority to God. Some of us don't realize who we already are. We're still trapped in an identity defined by sins that we or other people have committed. And some of those sins are fresh. Some of them are centuries old. We're trapped. We don't realize who we really are. We are still living under an assumed identity. We're still living like victims or we're still living with the guilt of oppressors. Stop it. Surrender all that to God. Start living like you are a son or a daughter of the God who adds, not subtracts. I told you earlier that I'd finish the story we started with, the one about that brash and confident boy named Tony the Chip Thief. I gave up that bag of chips because I could not bring myself to eat something his black hand might have touched. God is perfect and God is flawless. God never sins. God is holy and just and righteous and God has a wicked sense of humor. Because Tony and I wound up sharing quite a bit more a few years later. We were college roommates. God's got a sense of humor. That's what God does. God changes people. God changes people from whatever they were to what he wants them to be. And what he wants you to be is good. Could you use that this morning? Some change? Maybe your need for change has absolutely nothing to do with this sermon this morning, with the issue that we've talked about. And if it doesn't, that's awesome. That's, that's awesome. But maybe you need faith to face a struggle that you've got going on in your life right now. Maybe you need to be freed from an addiction. And and it might be a chemical addiction or it might be something else. You You might be trapped in a way of looking at women or looking at men that is not holy and is not helpful and is not right. Maybe... Maybe the thing that you need to deal with is to get past the failures of the past and embrace the new identity that God calls you to and offers to you this morning. There's so many of us in the room, I have no idea what could be going on in everybody's life or in anybody's life. I just know that if you need it, God can bring change to you. He's done that for me. God can bring change to you. And the cool thing is he takes you just as you are. And then he makes you into all that you can be. He makes you to be like his son, Jesus Christ. Could be that somebody here this morning is ready to give their lives to Christ in baptism. We will stop everything we're doing. We'll be late to lunch to witness you're giving your life to Christ in baptism. If you're ready to do that, come just as you are. Let's stand. Let's sing. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou didst me come to to read my
I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcome with open arms. Praise God, just as I am. Just as. offer up this time together to you this morning, our worship. And we offer up our lives to you this week, our worship. And in the silence, we proclaim you the only living, true, and almighty God who has made us worthy through the blood of his son. God, help us to reach across the aisle, to reach across the room, to reach across the office, to reach across the school, to reach across the street, and to tear down any barriers as we accept each and every person that we come into contact with as equals and as equally sinful and saved through your blood. We offer our thanks again for Jesus and for the almighty grace and power that we witness that you've extended by your hand and witness to us each and every day. And this is our prayer and all the degree say, amen. amen. Hey, I got a few little things here that really aren't nearly as important as what we've just done, but they make me do this anyway. Uh, there is a baby shower today. It's from 1.30 to 3. It's in the Mercy Building. It is for Justin and Mary Ashley Littell. They're expecting a girl, and they're registered at Babies R Us. Secret Church is coming up on Friday, April the 29th at 5.30. This year's topic is a global gospel in a world of religions. If you're attended, 
interested in attending, please contact Steve Krigger. Ladies Ministry Lift, Ministry Movie Night. Ladies, join us Friday night, April 8th, for a screening of War Room, not The War Room. Two different movies, two different contexts. War Room in the Fellowship Hall. Contact Ada Hanley for more information. Ladies Tea, the annual Ladies Tea is coming up April 23rd. If you're interested in decorating a table or would like more information, you can see Melissa Brown. Outback America is coming up also April 29th and May 1st. That's in your bulletin. Open mic night uh, is Friday, April the 22nd in the Mercy Building. If you'd like to perform, contact Dave Stewart. Most importantly, don't forget what we just did today. Don't forget what we've just shared together. And um, keep it at the center of your heart through this week. Let's close in prayer. Follow me. Father, we are thankful that all of us have access to your grace and mercy. We're thankful that we have a message of love and forgiveness and acceptance. Many of us have experienced it. Many of our friends and, and loved ones need to. Father, we ask you to be, help us be strong and courageous and to know, as Abraham did, that you are the provider. And you will help us carry the message of love and forgiveness, and grace and mercy that each of us needs to those who need it and may not realize it. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for the leadership here at this church. Bless us all as we strive to serve you well this week and every day of our lives. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.